after acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then i shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my god how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art welcome how's everybody doing great it's so good to see you to be here with you on our wednesday evening program my name is James Cocker, and I'm our Director of Counseling Ministries, and I uh, work over in Congregational Care with, and with the rest of the Wednesday night team. Um, so it's my joy to welcome you here. If this is your first time here, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about what you can expect each Wednesday night. At 5.30, we have a community meal that's uh, open to everybody. It's a $5 meal. Uh, kids fifth grade and under eat free. Um, the, you can access the menu online each week to know if that's going to be something that you're open to. And then at 6.15, uh, all around this building, we have different classes, groups that are meeting, uh, ways for you to grow deeper in your faith and become more connected with one another. And then in the foundry, uh, starting at 6.30, uh, we have those programs as well. Uh, right now, we're working through a sermon series on, on the weekends in worship that's focused on the Ten Commandments. And each week, we're kind of taking some time to say those together just so that we can uh, sort of write those on our hearts. Um, so this week's uh, commandment is do not steal. So we're all going to say that together. Do not steal. Uh, one more time. Do not steal. Pretty straightforward, right? Just don't steal. Um, so the last announcement that I have for you guys is uh, our Backpacks for Hunger program. The uh, Backpacks for Hunger ministry serves students uh, by providing a bag of easy-to-fix, kid-friendly food over the weekend. If that's a program that you're interested in, um, we, we get these big teams together, we stuff these backpacks, and then we send them out um, to kids that are in need. And you can go to core.org slash leewood slash backpacks. And I think that that's all I've got to say. I'm going to uh, offer a prayer for our meal and for our classes, um, and then I'll uh, send you guys out. Um, gracious God, thank you for this time together, for this opportunity to share a meal, uh, to share in fellowship with one another. Um, we are grateful for this time that we have, grateful for this food and for the hands that provided it. Uh, bless us as we continue to try to learn and grow closer to one another. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so if you're in your classes, uh, go ahead and um, you can go do your classes. That's, you're done. You can do that. If you're here in the foundry, um, we're going to start in about 10, 15 minutes so you can get settled. Um, if you've got to take your kids to child care, you can do that. Um, and what I'd like to see is, if it's possible, um, is to sort of fill up some of these front tables um, just because, you know, it's kind of lonely up here. Um, and uh, I've got some get-to-know-you questions uh, up here. So if you want to sort of create some conversation with the people at your table and get to know them, um, you can start to ask those questions. We'll come back here uh, at about 6.15. Or, sorry. 6.30. Yes. Thank you. Um, so what, what was, raise your hand if you decided on mosquitoes. You'd rather rid the world of mosquitoes. Raise your hand if you landed on the common cold. Okay. Um, the people who chose mosquitoes were right. Um, I know it seems like there's not a right answer to that, but mosquitoes are the animal that is responsible for the most human death in the history of the world. Um, so, I bet you feel bad now, common cold people. Um, I introduced myself a minute ago, but a lot of folks have come in since then. Uh, my name is James Cochran. I'm the Director of Counseling Ministries here at Church of the Resurrection. And uh, my role is to try to connect our church family and community with counseling resources. And uh, a big part of that 
is uh, assisting with programming like this that is focused on how do we um, grow individually, relationally, emotionally. Um, and I also collaborate with a lot of community partners like Quinn Egeseeker Mac. Um, so Quinn is a uh, licensed professional counselor in Missouri and in Kansas. Um, she has a private practice in Brookside QEM counseling. And yeah. Very original name. Yeah, those are her initials. Um, and um, she focuses on um, issues of gender, um, sexuality, sex therapy, relationships, and uh, went to University of Missouri, Kansas City um, for her uh, graduate work. Um, and then also did a graduate certificate program at the University of Michigan um, in the program on uh, sex therapy and sex education. Did I get that right? You got all that. Okay. Um, and Quinn and I actually went to grad school together. Um, and our very first day of um, uh, introduction to professional counseling, um, I remember her saying, I want to be a sex therapist. Um, or saying that that's what she wanted to do. And, and by God, she did it. Um, that's, that's a big part of what she does now. So tonight... Um, Quinn is going to, uh, she and I are just going to have a kind of a casual conversation, as casual a conversation as one can have, uh, about the topic of intimacy. Um, now, that's going to conjure up a lot of things for everybody, and so I want to spend some time thinking about what that means. Um, so Quinn, as we talk about intimacy, um, because of all the different things that that might stir up in our minds, can you help us um, understand what intimacy is. How would you describe it and define it for us? Is this on? It's on, yes. <laughs> um, so I want to answer that question, but first and foremost, I want to point out that usually when we hear the word intimacy, we think it's a euphemism for sex, okay? That is not how I'm using it in this context. Intimacy is any sort of close connection that you share with another person, okay? So the relationship between parent and child, that's intimate. No one knows a child like their parents. The intimate, uh, the relationship between partners, again, intimate. Who knows you like your partner? The relationship between you and your best friend. My goodness. If someone knows you in this world, it's your best friend. So when we're talking about intimacy, I really want you to open your mind up to considering it to be something other than strictly sexual. Yeah, so I remember when we were chatting about this, you were talking about one of the people with whom you feel most intimate. Yeah, it's my best friend who's actually watching this from Charleston, South Carolina. Um, yeah, so my best friend is probably hands down one of the people that knows me better than anybody else in my life. She's known me since I was little. Um, she's known me as I've gone through a lot of hardships, and she's seen me grow into the person that I am today. That process of walking together through life's challenges that's inherently intimate, okay? You can be intimately involved with somebody on an emotional level without that crossing into any level of sexual or physical contact or intimacy. Um, so that, that's helpful, a helpful introduction because we recognize that there's a, a, a broad diversity of folks that are here tonight that may be watching online that are participating in this um, and are maybe Maybe you're here individually, maybe you're here um, with a friend, uh, maybe you're here with your lifelong partner, um, but however you arrive here, I think it's fair to say that everybody here has people with whom you are intimate, um, people that you are deeply connected to. And part of what we're focusing on tonight is how can we um, use the things that science teaches us that you know relational experts can teach us to help us draw closer to one another in whatever those relationships are that we want to continue to cultivate. Um, so. Um, if people are so different, um, and we think about the kind of um, closeness that we ultimately want to achieve, um, are, are, there, are there things that apply to everybody? So, I mean, I, I'm thinking about, um, you know, the ways that I would cultivate intimacy with a friend, someone, you know, like my wife or my children. Um, are there sort of broad principles that we could use if we were trying to develop intimacy with anybody in our lives? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the thing that comes to mind with this and what I refer to most often is the work of John Gottman. Is anyone familiar with Gottman? Woohoo, you in the back, thumbs up, gold stars. Yes, Yay. yes, my people. Um, so for those of you who aren't, let me introduce you to my good bud, John Gottman. We're not really friends, but I feel as though I know him personally. Um, John Gottman is a relationship therapist, researcher, author, um, and the thing that's really cool about Gottman is he is one of the only people who actually has scientific 
data on what makes relationships work. You know, in counseling and therapy, we have tons of theory, but we have very little evidence. That's where Gottman comes into this. Um, he's based out of University of Washington, and what he's been doing for the last, gosh, almost three decades, um, is studying couples, something like a thousand plus couples, um, through a little apartment he coined as his love lab. Um, it sounds kind of creepy, but it's not. And what Gottman found is that there are certain predictors of healthy, long-lived relationships and also of relationships that don't last. Yes, his research was normed on romantic partners. However, these basic principles are widely applicable. If you are not currently in a relationship, please still be mindful, be aware of how you can take these and turn these towards the other relationships that you hold in your life. Um, so anyway, with these principles, he was able to identify with over 90% accuracy couples that would divorce. And he did this after watching them argue for only 15 minutes, okay? So the basic principles are outlined, I believe, above me? Yeah, yeah. above me. Um, so number one is love maps. What this is talking about is how acquainted are you with this person's world? What do you know about them? What do you know about what's going on in their life? How aware of you are the, of the relevant pieces of their current day-to-day -day life? The second, nurturing fondness and admiration. Create an environment that's conducive to these two things. Share your appreciation. Don't take things for granted. Be sure to say things out loud. Oftentimes, you like to say, oh, they know I appreciate. Oh, they know I love them. Yeah, they might, but it feels good to hear it too. So be mindful to express that. Next up, we're going to look at turning towards each other. So a brief little explanation on this one. We have these things called bids for connection. These are efforts to connect with the person um, that we're in proximity to. They can be things like, um, you know, giving your partner a kiss when you get home, saying thank you, checking in to see, hey, how was your day? So turning towards each other is the process of leaning in when your partner makes those efforts, being present, meeting them halfway. And the funny thing with turning towards each other and bids for connection is you're gonna drop the ball a lot, okay? We think to have a good relationship, we have to be perfect. We have to be you know, batting a perfect score, but the reality is, and what the research tells us, is good enough is good enough. And that's qualified by eight out of 10. So couples who are happy and stay together, they get about 80% of those bids. Couples who are seen to divorce, they only get three out of 10. And the thing that's funny with this is couples who stay together, relationships that stay intact, they don't fight less than the couples that split apart. They don't. But what they do have is an outpouring of positivity to counteract the negative. If you think about it like a bank account, sort of. One of the things that I will you talk about the 80% or um, kind of like the five to one, four to mm -hmm. one ratio, um, is I'll tell couples, um, if you know that you've got to have eight out of every 10 of your interactions being you know, these, these positive, affirming, um, fond kind of interactions that are reflective of turning toward each other, um, then you know that you're gonna have maybe over the course of the day, two or three things that are gonna go wrong two or three times where you're going to say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing. Um, so what does that mean? That means that you have to be really proactive about all those other things, about the kindness, about the, the affection, the, the nurturing, the, the calling and checking in, the asking your kid, hey, how was your day? I, I really want to really know what's going on with you. Um, because those things are not going to happen by accident. The mistakes almost always happen by accident, right? We're, we very rarely set out to say, how can I screw up uh, my best friend's life today? How can I screw up my, my partner's life today? Those happen by accident. So we have to be really intentional about those other things. Would that be a fair way to describe that? Yeah, and I, I think to the point about kids too, I think about you know having little kids, the mommy, 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 daddy, 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 seeing them, looking at them. I see you, I hear you, honey. I just need you to wait for a second. All of those are bids and how we're meeting them. Um, next up, we're gonna look at accepting influence. The key phrase with this one is yielding to win. When you are in any sort of relationship, you don't get to win all the time. You just don't. That's a hard lesson for some of us to learn. Um, but in yielding to win, we're really assigning value to the things that we hold most meaningful. And we're negotiating and we're compromising on all of the rest. 
Um, lastly, we're gonna look at solving, or we're gonna look at solving your solvable problems. Oh no, I kept doing phone, sorry. Solving your solvable problems. So there's perpetual problems that never go away and there's problems that can be solved. Being proactive, being solution focused and addressing the issues that you have power and control over. Which those can be kind of hard to identify sometimes. And then we have overcoming gridlock. So overcoming gridlock speaks to those issues that we're always arguing about. What are the themes in the relationship? I know a lot of couples that I work with, the, the unsolvable problems, the gridlock problems, tend to be things focusing on money, in-laws, kids, division of labor within the household, for example. And again, it's not the fact that you argue about these things, but it's that you do so with trust and respect. I wanted to, to point out, if you guys were able to be here last week, um, uh, Wendy and Kay McCarthy, who's a state certified mediator and family attorney, um, this overcoming gridlock, that's that was us zooming in. Last week's whole message was kind of zooming in to that idea, um, to, to those things in our life that create conflict and the ways and strategies to overcome them. If you weren't able to be here last week, I believe that that video is available online if you go to uh, core.org slash something. Um, if, you, if you search for it, I bet you'll find it. Um, but just wanted to point that out, that if you're looking for some practical tools to do that, um, you know, outside of a clinical space, that's, that's something that you might look into. So what's, tell us about this last step. Um, and the last one is creating shared meaning. So identifying kind of what the bigger purpose and goal is for your life and having whoever you're in relation to sharing theirs as well. And looking at those two perspectives and finding a way to integrate it as a whole. So there's a shared vision for your romantic relationship, for your friendship, for your family life, um, for your partnership. You know, if you're in business with somebody, shared goals are really, really important. They're very connection building. Um, and part of those shared goals that Gottman outlines, it's the four pillars. So rituals for connection, know what's going on in the other person's life that day. If you know your best friend has a big presentation, sending them a text beforehand, hey, you got this, you can do this, thinking about you, following up, hey, how did it go? That's a really easy way to connect and maintain that awareness. And then we're gonna look at supporting each other's roles. So a lot of couples fight about conversations regarding expectations that they've never even talked about. It's assumed, well, he should know. Well, she should know. They don't know. You need to talk about it. Um, so knowing what those expectations are and being sure you're on the same page is really important. Shared goals. So letting them know what you're working towards, letting them know how they can best support you and encourage you, how they can really be a cheerleader for the efforts that you're making in your life for your own self-betterment and the betterment of your relationship. And then shared values and symbols. What are the things that have meaning to us? You know, a great example of this would be, you know, having a cross or a rosary in your home. That symbolizes your faith. And having that in your home, in the forefront of your vision, it helps you be mindful of why it is you're doing what you're doing. It keeps us present. Um, so that's, that's kind of a, a, a crash course in some of these very basic ideas of what can help us build intimacy towards the people in our lives. Um, again, any relationship that we have that we want to lean into more. Um, a lot of what Quinn was talking about was drawn from this book, uh, The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work uh, by John Gottman. John Gottman has, I don't know, 50,000 books. Um, so you could probably find many that are, are really valuable. I know that in congregational care, we, we, we hand out copies of this book uh, for people to borrow all the time. Um, because it's something that I think our pastors have come to recognize is a really helpful way to help couples um, draw more closely together. Um, so that could be a resource if you're looking for a deeper dive and want to go and do a little bit more uh, work on your own to figure out what that looks like, um, then, then you can move along in those, in those lines. So we've got some uh, connection opportunities for you, and if you're joining us online, um, you'll be able to download those uh, on the page. Um, but I want to show everybody at the in your attendance notebooks, there should be um, these little uh, sheets. You may have already taken them out. Um, it says Relationships 101 Intimacy. Um, and then the first uh, thing that we're going to talk about is how do we cultivate intimacy? Um, so if you're here with uh, your significant other or you're here with a close friend, um, somebody that you, that you know well, um, then I want you to focus on the questions on the left. You're going to ask your partner the questions. You're going to switch. Um, if your partner doesn't know the answers to the questions, then you're going to tell them. Again, this is all about 
these, this is the love maps question. This is the understanding and exploring your partner's world. Um, and then if you're here on your own or if you're single, um, you're, you, don't, you didn't come with anybody, then I want you to find a partner. Um, you may have to jump around to tables if, to, to find somebody. I'm not sure exactly where everybody's spread out. Um, but these are kind of questions to get to know this person. They're not, they're not super deep or super intimate, but they do uh, start that journey of trying to cultivate intimacy, of saying questions like, um, how would you want your life to look different? How, how do you feel about your job? Um, again, questions that go beyond that surface level of, you know, what's the weather like today, those types of things. Um, so depending on which is most applicable to you, um, we're going to give you um, six minutes to have these conversations. And I know that that can feel uh, like a fire hose. Um, so in fact, I've changed my mind. I'm going to give you seven. Um, sorry, James. Um, so I'm going to give you seven minutes. Um, and then we will come back here and then we'll talk about some of the, the threats and obstacles that, that can impact our ability to be intimate with each other. All right, we're out of time. <laughs> so for those of you doing the category on the left, these questions are examples of questions that we look at when addressing love maps. So how aware you are of your partner's world. And I'm curious, for you coupled folks, if you're brave enough to say, how did you do? You did better. Than, good for you. I heard 50-50, I heard and uh, that you, one did girlfriend. better than the other. Okay. Okay. And so here's the thing, too. If you didn't do awesome, no big deal. I hope you had your ears wide open and you heard their responses. So hearing that information, taking it in, absorbing it, integrating it, and your understanding of their world, that's what's really important. And these answers are gonna change over time, so keep checking in, okay? You're a very good participant. I appreciate your biggest, vigorous head shaking, sir. Yeah. Yes, you. Um, <laughs> so, um, so we're gonna shift gears a little bit. So we've talked about these are the things that we can do to cultivate intimacy, but ultimately, um, we have to be paying as close attention, sometimes more attention to the threats to intimacy, the types of things that are going to impede our ability to be in these types of relationships with each other. Um, so, so because it's so easy, what are the things that we should be paying attention to um, that, that may be sort of threats to intimacy or would disrupt our ability to be connected with each other? Sure, so prolonged absence of or deficits in those seven principles is the big thing that you're gonna be looking at, that we're gonna be looking at. Um, and these deficits are evidenced in the following ways. Again, if you're falling short on some of these, please don't freak out and think that you're doomed. That's not the case. Know better, do better, right? So the first one we're gonna be looking at on here is harsh startups. So what this talks about is how you go into a conversation. Are you going into it hot? Are you going into it argumentative? If you are, guess what? The person you're talking to isn't gonna hear you because they're gonna tune out or they're gonna leave the room and you've gotten nowhere. So using gentle startups, I statements, approaching it from a place of kindness and respect. The second one we're gonna be looking at is what um, Gottman affectionately refers to as the four horsemen of the marriage apocalypse. Um, which yes, it's just as doomy and gloomy as the uh, biblical version of that would tell you. <laughs> I think, I think this would be a good spot to, to roll the video because it explains the, the horseman. It has the antidote. Oh, so no, we well. can't do the video yet. James, don't do the video. Do not do the video. He put his hands up. He's not going to do the video. Okay. Perfect. All right. So tell us what these, these, <laughs> these, these four horsemen are. Um, so the four ho horsemen of the marriage apocalypse is Gottman identifies them as criticism. So attacking the way someone does something. You never wash the dishes. You don't fold my shirts right. Why didn't you do this? Right? We know this one, criticism, complaining. Um, the next one we're going to look at is contempt. So contempt kind of nags at, pulls at, tries to undermine someone's sense of self. You know, oh, honey, I'll take the trash out in the morning. Oh, honey, I'll take the trash out in the morning. Something that's really belittling with the intention to hurt somebody, to bring them down. Um, and then we're going to look at uh, defensiveness. So that's kind of playing the victim to try to ward off perceived attacks. And then um, lastly, we're gonna look at um, stonewalling, which stonewalling is essentially a way of shutting off from the conversation to communicate some level of disapproval. 
It can be stopping talking, it can be literally physically moving, it can be crossing your arm, anything that conveys, I'm not here for this conversation. Quinn doesn't know it, but I'm stonewalling her right now. So. You're stonewalling me? Because I haven't been talking to while well, she's been talking. I'm just kidding. I was trying to make a joke. You can all laugh um, because I said a funny joke. So thank you. Jimmy's doing a really great example of showing what attentive listening looks like, right? <laughs> Reflective listening. Um, so that's what Gottman calls the four horsemen of the marriage apocalypse. And we're going to talk about these a little bit further in a couple minutes. But frame of reference, that's what they are. Um, and then we're going to look at flooding. So flooding is a state of becoming so overwhelmed you can't process what is happening. I think we've all been there to some extent. And here's why flooding is such a problem. Whenever we get overwhelmed in today's day and age, even the smallest stressors we encounter, our bodies respond the same way our great, 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 great grandpa did when they were being chased by a saber-toothed tiger. Our body responds the same. It perceives it as a threat. So if you're always getting flooded when you're talking with your partner, guess what? You're starting to associate your partner with a threat. And with that, we have an elevated physiological response to their presence. That doesn't feel good. Body language and repair. So with flooding, we don't want to become so overwhelmed that we're not hearing, but we also want to have a certain level of a response that shows we're here for the conversation, we're responding to, we're having empathy with what we're being told. Lack of that, again, not a great thing. Failed repair attempt. So you guys know how I told you about bids for connection. Repair attempts are similar. So when you're fighting, it's the effort to connect. It's making a joke. It's, you know, you're fighting, 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 and all of a sudden you look at the person across from you and they just go, do you laugh at them? Do you keep yelling? Do you say, God, you're so dumb. Why don't you take this seriously? Or do you laugh with them? Do you stick your tongue out with them? Do you pull them in close and give them a hug? What do you do? Okay? Silliness is oftentimes a way that we try to make repair attempts to de-escalate a conversation. And then we're going to look at bad memories. So that's the perspective through which we look at things that have occurred. So whatever the opposite of rose-colored glasses are, that's what this is. Uh, uh, Dirt-colored glasses. Dirt-colored glasses. That feels like an smudged, opposite to me. Yeah. Smudged glasses. Yeah. So when we look back on, let's say, your wedding day, instead of seeing all the things that went right, well, he was seven minutes late. The food was cold. The DJ stunk. Um, I stepped my toe on the dance floor, right? Perspective is important, you guys. So those are the big things that we're going to look at um, as far as threats to intimacy go. James, roll that video. But there's great news. Oh, sorry, but there's great news. Roll so the video. Selfish. <laughs> what an idiot. It's not my fault we're always late. Forget it. Criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. Dr. John Gottman calls these negative communication patterns the four horsemen of the apocalypse because they'll lead to the end of your relationship. In fact, he can predict this relationship failure with over 90% accuracy if the behavior isn't changed. So what can you do? Well, at the Gottman Institute, we understand you might not even know you're communicating this way, or you might not know how to control it. But if you practice the following four research-based antidotes, there is hope for your future. Criticism attacks the character of the recipient instead of focusing on a specific behavior. The antidote to criticism is to talk about your feelings using I statements, then express a positive need. Contempt is an expression of superiority that comes out as sarcasm, cynicism, name-calling, eye-rolling, sneering, mockery, and hostile humor. Contempt is the greatest predictor of relationship failure and must be eliminated. The antidote to contempt is to treat one another with respect and build a culture of appreciation within the relationship. Defensiveness is self-protection through righteous indignation or playing the victim. Defensiveness never solves the problem and is really just an underhanded way of blaming your partner. The antidote to defensiveness is to accept responsibility, even if only for part of the conflict. Stonewalling occurs when the listener withdraws from the conversation without resolving anything. It takes time for the negativity created by the first three horsemen to result in stonewalling. But when it does, it can become a habit. The antidote to stonewalling is to break for at least 20 minutes, 
Calm down, then return to the conversation. Spare your relationship from certain destruction. Learn more about eliminating the four horsemen by visiting our site. All right. So that gave a, a, a brief introduction to what we can do when we find uh, those, those four horsemen which feel like um, the most ominous of the things that we could do wrong. The end of the um, world. So, you know, the most biblical things we can do wrong. Um, so how, so I, it might be valuable to do sort of a deeper dive into how these things sort of show up in our relationship and the things that we can do to address them. Yeah, so um, just to kind of go through and reiterate again, and this is what I tell couples when I'm working with them, if there is anything that you take away from this, please hear that while we all have issues within our relationships, there are ways to get it back on track if you have the desire to do so, okay? The word antidote is used in this, and it's pretty appropriate. So consider whenever you maybe feel inclined to, you know, criticize your partner, instead think about complaining without blaming. You know, in therapy we do a lot of what we call I statements or I feel statements. You know what, I just feel really frustrated that the dishes weren't put away. You know, could you grab them for me so I can go take a break? Identifying the behavior we have an issue with without making it personally um, symbolic or representative of the person that we're speaking to. Contempt, culture of appreciation, which that's really similar to that second principle that we looked at in those top seven. So again, expressing gratitude, noting the things that um, someone's doing to make your life better. I always say, you know, one of the worst things to feel in life is taken for granted, right? to feel unappreciated. Let your partner know, let your friend know, let your coworker or colleague know, hey, I see this thing you did for me. It made me feel really great, thank you. Because that's one of the tips too when we talk about intimacy is, is the more specific you can be in this thing that made you feel a certain way, the more connection building it is. When we look at um, defensiveness, this one's hard. Well, how can I take responsibility for something I didn't do? If you just can't muster up the gusto to do that, work on accepting this other person's perspective. Sure, you didn't mean to hurt them. Sure, you didn't mean to offend them. But you know what? It happened. Validate them. Empathize with them. Show up for them. If at the very least you can say, you know what? Yeah, I can hear how that upsets you. I'm so sorry. That's enough. It's joining. Again, it's connection building. And lastly, when we look at stonewalling, self-soothing, most couples I hear say, well, then they wanted to walk away from me, or we were in a fight and they left the room. Good. <laughs> That's respectful. That's you noticing that you're getting too heated to listen and be fully present. And you're giving yourself, the person you're in connection with, and the relationship, the respect to not escalate, to calm down, to take a break. But it's taking a break with the intention and with the knowledge that this conversation is going to be returned to as soon as you calm down, okay? I, um, I saw a lot of knowing looks um, uh, among some of the couples out there um, as we went through those. And, that's, and it's valuable to recognize where this is going to show up in your own relationship. Um, we, we may circle back to the magic six. Quinn, Quinn really wants to talk about the magic six, but I want to make sure that we are able to focus on some of these other things as well. So... Um, this is going to be more of an individual activity um, that we want everybody to participate in. So even if you're here with a couple um, or you came with somebody else, um, we're going to give you a few minutes to um, consider these four horsemen and how they might show up in different relationships in your life. So you may see these in your, uh, your partnered relationship, somebody that you're in a couple with, or if you're single, you may see this with a friend, you may see this with a family member. Um, I know that in, in my therapy office, I see, this, I see these a lot with families, um, the ways that uh, parents talk to their kids, the ways that brothers and sisters talk to each other. Um, so think about the different people in your life um, that you see these showing up with, and then think about how you specifically would apply some of these antidotes in those relationships. Um, so if you look at your sheet, the second half under break two, it says uh, repairing intimacy. Um, so just take some time and explore those. Um, if you're here with someone that you, you're comfortable talking with about, you can feel free to do that. Um, but we're going to give you um, six minutes to spend some time reflecting on these on your own. Ready, go.
the the lights blinked, which I think means that um, we were engaged in conversation up here. Yeah. Um, so um, for those of you that don't know, this is Reverend Wendy Lyons Crossdeck. Um, Hello. She's our senior director of congregational care um, and a uh, pastor. Uh, you're married. You've got children, a yeah. child. Yeah. And um, so we're we're talking about we're talking about sex. All right. Let's just. Yes, yeah, so multiple people have. What's who sang that song? Is that Salt and Pepper? Salt and Pepper. Yeah. They um, uh, multiple people have started quoting that song to me today because I said that we were talking about sex tonight. Um, so let's just name right up front that this might feel a little weird and strange to talk about sex in a church, but um, we think that sex is a good thing that God created us for, and so we're just going to talk about it and figure out how does this. Uh, show up in our um, our covenantal relationships. So um, let's ask for consent. So yeah, well that's a good a good thought. Well, so where so well here I got actual questions, well, Quinn. Well, Hold your horses. Say, here's what I will ask you guys too. So sex can be kind of a loaded topic for folks. So in the spirit of consent, I want to know: Do I have your permission to talk about sex? Answer questions about sex with you all. Is that okay? Okay. And I want to give you permission. If something makes you too darn uncomfortable or you need to check out for a little bit, please practice self-care. Mm -hmm. I want this to be informative. I want this to be helpful. I don't want this to be traumatizing. Um, and I'm going to be speaking in generalizations. So if something doesn't fit into your life, that's fine. That's totally fine. You don't have to adopt it, okay? Um, so please, if you hear something, you're like, wait, that's not me, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. We're not one size fits all, and neither are the way our sex lives look or work. Yeah. Um, so so we, when we opened up the conversation, we talked about how we're, we're talking about intimacy. And for a lot of us, um, if, if we hear the word intimacy, we're thinking about, oh, well, that's just a euphemism for sex. Like when people say intimacy, they mean sex. Um, hopefully what we've opened the door to is the recognition that intimacy is first and foremost about an emotional connection. There's a, a sex therapist one time who said it to me like this. Um, intimacy is into me see, into me see, um, and so just that sense of like like really raw vulnerability that we have with other people. Um, but let's talk a little bit about like how do we translate this like relational emotional intimacy into um, physical intimacy. So that really depends on what sex therapist or researcher you ask. To be completely honest, um, within my community of folks I run with, there's two big prevalent um, theories, um, one of which is kind of akin to Gottman. So emotional closeness translates into sexual desire. And when I say desire, I mean the wanting of, okay? And then on the flip side of that, you have researchers and therapists like Esther Perel and Jack Morin who say that intimacy, um, emotional intimacy can actually be a threat to desire. Um, so one sees it as a catalyst, one sees it as a barrier. And with the latter, with the barrier portion, what they talk about is closeness is needed for intimacy, but distance is needed for desire. So a lot of times, you know, if you know someone too well, right? We talk about like that taking for granted piece. We're not quite aware, we're not quite embracing or appreciating what's in front of us. So, so part of what I'm hearing is that it, it requires balance. It requires a sense yes. of... We're, we're paying attention to our, our closeness, but we're also creating sufficient uh, space for sort of to have our individuality mm -hmm. um, sort of known and to sort of know each other. So there's sort of yeah. the balance that we have to bring a lot of intentionality to paying attention to. Yeah, and you know, the thing I kind of think of is, um, you know, for those of you in a relationship, you know, you've been with this person for a while, you know them really well, but then all of a sudden you find out something new about them, right? You see something a little bit differently, and that newness, that's exciting, right? And that can translate into desire because it's something out of the norm. And, you know, between those two theories, what I see in, in my practice with the folks I work in and even with my friends when we talk about this very thing, because that's what you do when you're a sex therapist, apparently, um, is it's a really, it's an interesting balance of both. So having the emotional or the um, intimacy or closeness to feel connected, to feel trusting, to feel safe, to feel as though your safety, well-being is not being threatened when you're engaging with a person, 
but also having that distance to see yourselves as two separate people and having that curiosity. And that's when I go back to like the love maps and the principles, the seven principles is, gosh, stay curious about their world. You know, just because a lot of times when we get in relationship with people or we get married, we get this mentality of like, aha, I have them. But what if we looked at our relationships as a way to constantly keep that person um, in our lives? So making a constant concerted effort to continue to get to know them, to continue to connect. I like that. Um, there's an author, um, a, a spiritual writer named Richard Rohr, who says, um, a mystery isn't something that is unknowable. It is something that is endlessly knowable. Hmm. Um, and so if we think about our relationships as having this mysterious quality to them, that doesn't mean that, that we can't figure them out or we won't know them. It means that we'll never stop knowing them. We'll always be continuing to learn about them. So my next question <clears throat> is for both of you. Um, so you both, uh, Wendy in your role as a care pastor, um, Quinn as a therapist, you sit down with people and they might name um, some, some difficulty, some challenge that's related to sex. Um, what do you see most often and how do you offer people um, sort of guidance with those things? Wendy, do you wanna start? Sure, um, I think, well, most likely when folks are coming to me and they're oftentimes coming when things have gotten really challenging. And so as it relates to sex, conversations that I've seen happen with people relate to infidelity or, you know, a breach of trust. And what does that kind of look like? So that's sort of the, you know, the opposite end of the spectrum. And one of the things that I say we when we do our premarital counseling is to say, talk to a therapist before it gets to the place where there has been a breach of trust. You know, like if you can at all possible, before you get to that place, have that conversation. And so it's talking with couples and, or one or the other and having an honest and real conversation about what do you do, what are your next steps? And listening and being present with someone and saying, well, do you want to work through this? Do you want to have a conversation? Do you want to repair the trust that's been broken? Do you want to have, can, do you want to try and work in and through this relationship and, and rebuild trust and form those bonds again? Or do you say it's, it's too far gone? I can't do this anymore. What does that look like? So I would say like, that's at least one of the extreme ways that folks kind of come and, and share that conversation with me. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I, I always tease my clients um, and I say like, yes, please come in. Like when things are great, don't stop going to therapy. When things are great, that's when you really do that enrichment piece, that deepening piece. And that by and large is such a protective factor for relationships. Um, so yes, I do see a lot of couples that come in after intimacy or you know, breaches of trust, but more often than not, actually what I see show up in my office, it's people who have different levels of desire. So we call it desire discrepancy. Um, lots of these folks are male-female relationships in the way you know arousal and desire works between men and women. Functionally, it's different. Um, one of my favorite author puts it as, you know, you have all the same parts, they're just arranged in a different order. Um, and while that's true, the actual pathways that those different parts go through to reach the same outcome, vastly different, vastly different. And people don't know that because a lot of what we're taught about sex and response, it's normalized on male bodied individuals, on male responses. So female sexuality, it, people treat it like a mystery. There's not a lot of information about it. Um, one of my favorite authors, and Jimmy mentioned her, yesterday, I think, when we were talking, is Emily Nagoski. She speaks a lot about the research on female sexuality. It's research-based. It's very comforting. It's very affirming. It's a wonderful book. It's called Come As You Are. It's lovely. And actually, just this last June, she came out with a workbook, um, a Come As You Are workbook. I've, I've, I, I own it, Delightful. but I haven't gone through it um, yet. But, um, so um, help me. Um, sorry, I actually have the questions written down. Um, so when folks, um, are, are dealing with something that is, um, that they feel a lot of shame about, um, how do you, how do you help them work past that shame? One of the biggest things that comes to mind when we talk about shame, the word that pops up in my head automatically is giving yourself some grace, right? We're human, we're learning. 
whenever we have feelings of shame or guilt, what that is doing inherently is something happened that violated our own values or boundaries and that shame or guilt response, it's a response to that acknowledgement. So understanding what that is, understanding why it happened and finding a way to realign your behavior to be um, in line with your values and belief system. Um, I guess I would, I, would, I would sort of come alongside of the idea of, of, of being able to offer yourself grace and, and help you to see that there may be times in our lives when we do things that maybe we wish we didn't do. And we all have those things. I mean, none of us are perfect, and we're seeking to do the very best that we can. Um, but being able to say, how do I work through that? So I have a little boy who's four years old, and I was sharing with Brent Talley, who I'm going to be teaching a class with last, next week. And he was sharing with me, he was at a soccer game a few weeks ago, and he ran into this little girl, and he hit her, and it really disturbed him that he'd hurt this girl's feelings. And as he and I were talking about it, I said, did it make you feel bad? And I was thinking, did it make you feel sad? But he, and, and he got so distraught, and I'm not bad. And he was interpreting my understanding of a language that he didn't quite understand. He was like, I'm not bad. And I said, I didn't mean bad, I meant sad. Did it make you sad that she was sad? And sometimes we interpret those things of, I feel guilty for something that I did, and I'm a bad person. And we carry that around, and being able to say, I'm not a bad person. I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to do things that, and I'm, I'm going to try and keep doing the best that I can, but I'm going to have humility in it, and I'm going to recognize that also the other people that I love, op offering them grace and comfort and love as well. So. I, that, those are both really excellent responses, and part of the reason I, I bring this up is because I think a lot of us have um, understandings of sex and sexuality that is built around shame. Um, we're taught what's wrong with our bodies, you know, that we need to, um, that our bodies are out of control, that we, you know, we have to sub subdue them and that we should listen to our, um, listen to our brains and not our bodies, which are the same thing. It's, it's a really confusing world to live in. And then we're also sort of bombarded with stimulus that tells us, um, that sex is everywhere and sex is easy and sex isn't complicated. And, um, we, you know, so it's, it's really hard to make sense internally and morally of what that looks like. Um, Wendy, one, one question that I'll ask you, like, um, when you're trying to offer somebody um, guidance on, like, um, what's okay, what's not okay, like, how do, how do they set up healthy sexual boundaries from, from a spiritual pastoral perspective, what kind of guidance do you give them? Well, as I'm, I'm having conversations with people, I would say that ultimately as, as Christians, what we hope and what we feel like God's ultimate you know, highest calling is for us to be in an intimate, sexual intimate relationship with those for whom we are committed and we're in a covenant relationship with and marriage and and trying to help folks see what that looks like and, and try and offer encouragement for them to, to see the importance of a, a deep connection that we have with someone allows us to be able to share all of who we are in a vulnerable way. And so as you think about you know, even within a relationship to be able to say, you can have clear boundaries about what you say yes to and what you say no to and what feels what feels appropriate and what doesn't feel appropriate. I know you sort of, you began our conversation with cons consent and being able to say, just because we are in a relationship doesn't mean you are owed something. Mm -hmm. And being able to have clear understanding that it's not, it's sex when, it is a beautiful and wonderful and scary and sometimes messy kind of crazy thing, but it also requires us not using it as something less than it is. And so that's not a bargaining chip. You know, that's not saying, if you do this, I'll have sex with you, because that just sort of belittles the, the intimacy and the connection that you have with someone else. So saying, I'm, I'm not going to use it in that way, or I'm not going to withhold it in order to get something else that I really want. And so helping people to see what does that look like and finding ways that they can have open conversations and not feel ashamed about sharing what, what they feel and, and having conversations about what feels good and what doesn't feel good and and they don't need to have those with me, but they should have those with one another or, you know, have conversations with, if, with a therapist if they want to have that. I so. love those conversations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So um, I think one of the things that we've, we've, we've pointed to a lot, but that I am, um, it, it's, I, it's, it's become more important to me um, as, a, as a father of girls. That shouldn't matter. It should be important to all of us no matter what, but we feel it more acutely when there are people in our lives that we feel some degree of responsibility and, and, and want to care for. Um, and that's this idea of, of consent um, and what is consent. Um, one of the things that I say often is free and enthusiastic consent. That is, your, your yes can't be a yes um, if you're not free to say no. Um, so if you're in any kind of context in which there is a differential in power or authority, um, where there isn't that same kind of freedom to say no, then, then consent re really doesn't exist. And, and ultimately, um, if we talk about being creatures created in the image of God and carrying this sacred worth, um, that, and we're sort of offered this, this free will, then we have to respect one another's um, individual autonomy, and we have to be able to honor that consent. Um, one of the things, and, I, and we, you may have been getting to this in a minute, but we talk about this idea of the sin of reductionism in reducing the value of a human being um, beyond, past a sacred object, in, into something that is instrumentalized and is, it exists for our own gratification. Um, so things like infidelity, um, sexual violence, sex as a tool, um, pornography, a lot of those things can function in that way and often do function in that way because we're reducing human beings, uh, individuals of sacred worth, and we're making them objects for our own gratification. Um, so those are some values that I think are important to us. And, just, and when we talk about what are the sort of foundational elements of what is healthy sexuality, um, those are the things that I think we would, I mean, I encourage my couples to pay attention yeah. to. I know that Quinn probably does, and I know Wendy does as well. What so. I always tell people, too, is, I mean, when you look at your boundaries in any essence of your life, you have to consider, you know, what are your values? What are your, mor like, what are your morals? And aligning those boundaries to be in check with those things. That's what allows you to enjoy the activities that you're engaging in. You know, and what I always tell people, like enthusiastic consent, absolutely, because I don't know about you, but it wouldn't do a lot for me if I said, hey, honey, it's tonight the night, and my partner said, ugh, okay. You know, I mean, that's not nice. That's not connection building. That doesn't feel good. You know, whenever you show up to be sexually intimate with someone, I want to know that the person I'm about to do this thing with is really, really into this thing that's going to be happening too. Because here's the thing. Sex, it's a way for us to play as adults. It's a way for us to be expressive. It's a way for us to be creative. It's a way for us to engage with another human being in a way that we don't have the freedom or flexibility to do in other areas of our life. In I think that's important, and I think that's a wonderful thing to share with the individual that you're in relation to. In relation to. Um, I think, that, yeah, that's a great way of thinking about it. Uh, just this idea of, um, of intimacy being this, beyond just the, the physical vulnerability and the, the nakedness of it, but just the idea of um, it, is a, it is a space that we share with, with one other person. Um, again, when we talk about that highest calling. And thinking about the way that we share that space um, is something that um, we want to be able to honor fully um, in the space of those relationships. Um, so, uh, Quinn, uh, uh, if you could identify what, what are the myths you see as most prevalent um, that are related to sexuality? So people come into your office and they say, um, I'm reminded of that scene, um, there's a, a, a famous movie that references sexuality, and someone says, is it true that if you don't use it, you lose it? Um, which is a little bit silly, but it's this idea of, of what are the myths, I was going to try to ask, what are the myths that you, that you see um, occurring most often uh, related to sexuality? Um, so I'll answer that question first. If you don't use it, you do not lose it. It is still there, okay? It's not something that's lost. And I would tell you, y'all are sexual throughout your lifespan. It looks different at different phases. I know it, I get it, but here's the thing. You're still sexual creatures. And that's something to be thankful for. Um, myths I see, and this is kind of my, my pedestal as well, um, and a lot of these are very socially based, mid, you know, Midwestern cultural based, is this idea that guys always want to have sex. Men are animals, they always want to have sex, they should always be ready to go. So what does that say to a guy who doesn't want to have sex? What does that say about a guy who's having you know, issues with, can I say erection? 
You can say erection, yeah. With erection. <laughs> what does that say about him? Because what we're doing in that myth is we're essentially emasculating somebody. And with that emasculization comes a lot of anxiety. And with anxiety, that also lends itself towards different issues of functionality. So that's one of my big pedestals that I always tell people. Men don't always want to have sex, okay? And if they don't, that's okay. Um, and the other one I look at is this idea that sex should always be spontaneous. It should always be hot. It should always be spur of the moment. Anyone in here have kids, little or raised? Okay, so when you have little children, like how much spontaneous sex do you really have? I have a toddler, it doesn't happen in my household. It's like, all right, bedtime, wash the dishes, maybe tonight's the night, nope, I'm asleep, see you in the morning. Um, so sex isn't spontaneous for most people. And you know what, that's okay. I always joke, and my husband's probably watching this, but I am a marriage and sex therapist married to a mechanical engineer. Any assumption or stereotype that you want to insert about my marriage, you would be correct. My husband's a planner, right? I get Google invites for all sorts of things, and I think it's hot. I do, because when I get that Google invite to sit on the couch and snuggle, what that's telling me is my husband cares enough about me and about our relationship to make it a priority. We schedule play dates, we schedule tire rotations, I mean, we schedule our you know, annual OB visit. Why, why would you not schedule sex? And I always tell people, like, you know, if you wanna be flirty, send your, send your somebody a little Google Calendar invite for later that night, you know? You, me, bedroom, 8.30, to, you know, to be determined. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, well, thank you for allowing us that insight into the ways that um, intimacy can show up um, as it relates to sexuality. We've got some questions, and actually none of these have to do directly with sex. I mean, sex may be a part of them. Um, but Wendy, anything that you wanted to add um, that you felt like we didn't get to um, from a pastoral perspective? Yeah. I mean, I guess I would just say I, I want to encourage you to... if to be open and to have conversations, you know, see somebody. If you want, if you want to have conversations about your relationship, you have questions. Like, we we have confidential and open conversations, and so feeling free to have those conversations. But again, if you don't feel comfortable with those as well, we want to help you get connected to the people who who can maybe offer additional assistance and support and. Just kind of as a reminder, again, it can feel awkward at times, but it's also an incredible gift. And remembering that it is a beautiful way for you to be able to form deeper and really beautiful connections and, and allowing yourself to say, okay, this is, this is enjoyable and this is fun and this is, you know, it's planned sometimes. And sometimes it's marvelous and sometimes it's okay. You know what I mean? Like just, you know, like they're... There are levels of those kinds of things, but, but again, reminding yourself that it, it's an opportunity for you to draw really near to somebody, to know them in a really deep and beautiful way. Um, well, again, thank you for helping us dive into that. So we, some of the questions that we got, um, um, and again... Thank you for whoever submitted these questions. Yes, thank you very much. Um, our families and friends are so spread out. How do we cultivate intimacy and connection across physical distance, like uh, across the U.S., for example? I'll go on this one. Um, so my best friends all live in places other than Kansas City, but we talk frequently. We have scheduled times. We plan vacations together in the summer. I'm planning a vacation for next summer for two of my friends to fly in town and go down to the lake house. It's about being intentional. And, you know, it's, it's a hard thing to be mindful of, especially when we all have busy lives. But set it as a priority. And, again, I'm a big fan of lists. Every Sunday at 7 p.m., write a reminder in your Google Calendar or your planner. Call Tom. I don't know why Tom came to mind. I don't have a friend Tom. named Tom. You can call Tom. You can call anybody you like, but Tom for sure. Um, yeah. I was going to say, I, I remember listening to someone once on a podcast who said that their family does kind of a running email. And, and they don't say, you don't have to write tons of things down. 
just sort of say what the day, what happened that day, whether it was funny or silly or whatever. If it's two lines or if it's two paragraphs, there's no agenda. We just kind of reply all so that there's constantly something coming in from random things that happen in the day because it's it's the important things, but it's also the, oh, you know, so-and-so lost their tooth today or I found this really great, I don't know, like, I don't know what you get excited about. I found this really great recipe and I met, you know, like, it seems really small, but inviting them into the small everyday kinds of things may help can also help you feel really connected to them. But see, I don't think that's small. I mean, what that mm-hmm. speaks to is that love map idea. So it's staying intimately in tune with and knowing what's going on in people's lives. Mm-hmm. And some Sometimes, and we know this, like, if you know someone really well, you know if they take cream or sugar, like, you know their favorite food, you know these things, and those ongoing conversations is what facilitates that knowledge, and it's what keeps them updated as those things change. Um, One of the words that keeps recurring, and I I mentioned this week one when we started the series, is intentionality. Um, It is... um, you know, you will have lots of incidental contact with the people that you're in close relationship with, um, but the stuff that's really good is the stuff that you're intentional about. It's the stuff that you plan, the stuff that you really lean into. Um, I have six younger brothers, and there's no way I'd be able to stay in touch with all of them, but all six of them, well, let me rephrase that. Four, two of them are like under 10 years old, um, but four of them, and then like three of my brother-in-laws, we all play fantasy football together. And, you know, I've got opinions about football, whatever. Um, It's an opportunity for us to stay engaged, and it's a way that we sort of stay intentional. And we have a fantasy football draft every year that gets everybody together, and we trash talk each other each week. Um, But, again, there are spaces that we decide to be intentional about, and that's part of what can cultivate that connection. Um, Good question. Yeah. Um, How can my partner and I have better conversations while kiddos are constantly needing our attention? And maybe I'll throw the question, and we've talked a little bit about what this looks like for sexual intimacy as well, but I'll throw that on there as well. Beyond just, you know, conversations that drive connection, um, when, you know, when kids feel like they're just, you know, dominating our lives, and we all three have young kids, um, what does that look like, and how do we facilitate intimacy in those spaces? (laughs) I don't advocate for trying to have serious conversation when your kids are awake. That doesn't work very well. Um, so one of the things we didn't touch on is um, this idea of, I call it like uh, the state the state of the union address as far as relationships go. So having a set time every week where you come together to talk about what's going on, how it's faring, what's your relationship up to, and having a date night. And those bigger conversations, giving them, holding on to them until you're in that space to be able to have those conversations. If it's important to you, give it the respect it deserves to not have them constantly interrupted. That being said, I'm a big fan of when I'm trying to talk to somebody and my kid's, you know, pulling on me or has the zoomies. You know what, bub? I see you. I hear you. But I'm going to finish talking to your dad real quick. I'll be right with you. Right? And a lot of this comes down to parenting philosophies, and that might not be how everybody operates. But I think whenever we can show that priority and that respect by our partner, we're also setting a really great example for our kids. So that's my my I think that that's... That's a valuable lesson to recognize, uh, communicating to your kids, hey, you know, this is something that we want to really lean into, um, is that, you know, adults are having a conversation that we really want to be focused on. Um, So you deserve attention, too. I want to turn towards this as well. But um, we also want to model for them what that looks like to have those intentional conversations. You mentioned this state of union. I, I talk about it with my couples as a safety valve. Um, so if you think about the pressure that builds, um, you know, with, without connection, you know, one day, two day, three days, four days, and that pressure starts to build, and eventually it's going to explode. Um, so the more often you can have regular conversations, the more you have flexibility to release that. Um, when, I, when I have couples that come in in conflict, my very first assignment for them is you've got to start talking to each other every day for at least 30 minutes. And that can sound dramatic, and a lot of people can say, what? How? What? No way. And then what I say is that's three and a half out of every 168 hours. There's 168 hours in a week. I'm asking for you to commit to using three and a half of them to become more closely connected to each other. Now granted, you you may have to find another number that works for you, and maybe it's not all at once. Maybe maybe you've got to figure out ways to look like that, but then I think it all boils down to intentionality. Well, and I think communication too, I mean, we always think about communications as words specifically, but communication can be holding hands. Right? Communication can be, you know, just putting yourself in physical proximity. It can be that knowing look, right? I mean, there's different ways that we communicate to those around us without saying a single word. Body language, right? Nodding along, that's communication. 
I would just sort of add, like, again, for contacts kind of in throughout the day, you know, like, I'm in the car a lot, and so is my husband. We're driving, we're commuting, kind of coming back and forth, and I will call him on my way into the office because I know he's he's usually on it. Like, we kind of sort of find that timing, and being able to have a five- or seven-minute conversation while it's on Bluetooth and just connect or texting throughout the day, or if he calls me, me trying to be really intentional about making sure that I have an opportunity to call him back, knowing we share calendars so I know when he's free and he knows when I'm free. And if we want to have, even if it's a, you know, a two-minute conversation, we have a chance to connect throughout the day. Um, thank you guys both so much. Um, I, I want us, to, just because I want to respect you guys' time, um, if you um, want to get connected with a counselor, um, I can get you connected with a counselor this week. You, you, you can be sitting with a counselor this week um, or next week or the week after. Quinn takes a little longer because she's very well, highly sought after. Um, but if you go to core.org slash request care, um, you'll find a link there that you can use to request a counseling referral. Um, you can request pastoral care, you can request a hospital visit, you can submit a prayer request. There's all kinds of things that you can connect with our care department. But tonight specifically, if, if we've been talking about things that you've said, man, uh, we need help figuring out how this actually fits into our lives. Um, if you go to core.org slash request care, a, a huge part of my job um, and the people that I work with is to try to help you get connected with that. So I'm, I'm gonna leave that up there for just a minute, core.org slash request care. And then what I will piggyback with that, too, is if you're looking for someone specifically who does sex therapy work, um, please be sure you're seeking out someone who actually has a pretty pretty wealthy educational background in this. Yeah. Um, ASECT.org, A-A-S-E-C-T.org. And you want to search for sex therapists specifically is a great resource to find qualified, educated sex therapists in the area, I actually am accepting new patients. Okay, yeah, when, I guess yeah. you're opening, you're moving to a new office. Yeah. I am moving to a new office yeah. and I will be seeing new patients. Okay. Um, so if you like the cut of Quinn's jib um, <laughs> and you can find a way to remember her last name, which is Egaseeker Mac. Um, uh, I'm the only person with, with my last, last name, name believe it or Mac. not. I believe you. Um, so um, <laughs> anyway, so a couple, of, a couple more things <laughs> next week. Um, Wendy, and we have one more question. Wendy, I'm going to make you talk about this next week with uh, Brent. Um, so come next week if your question didn't get answered tonight. Um, next week, Bren, uh, Wendy and Bren Talley are going to be talking about um, kind of what do we do when we need to start um, ending relationships or drawing boundaries in relationships or figuring out when relationships aren't super healthy and we just need to, to, to create space. What does that look like? Is that a fair summary of what we're talking about next week? Great. Um, the other thing I'd say is if you could please uh, clear off your tables, um, take your attendance notebooks to the back and any trash, if you can clear those off, that's a big help to us. Um, anyway, thank you all so much for joining us tonight and we thank look you. forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.